Hello and welcome to our program, the Toxic Substance Control Act Amendments at Five Years, Opportunities to Act with Foresight. My name is Trish Komen and I'm a researcher at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. And I am delighted to introduce tonight's program as part of the Michigan Center on Life Stage Environmental Exposure and Disease. In the United States, everyone is exposed to industrial and toxic chemicals dozens and probably hundreds well before birth. The amount of chemicals manufactured and imported continues to grow. It's in the trillions of pounds. And these chemicals remain largely unregulated and untested for their health effects. Toxic chemicals can harm our health as these substances are present in everyday products, things like our cleaning products, cookware, housing materials, bedding, toys, even our water. Some chemicals affect our immune system or cardiopulmonary health, which may result in worse, worse health, which is especially important during a global pandemic. We need to learn more about the connections between environmental chemicals and our health and how environmental laws can help to protect us. Today, I'm joined by Professor Gil Oman. Dr. Oman is the Harold T. Shapiro Distinguished University of Michigan professor, and he plays a really important research role bridging medicine and public health. He's the past president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies of Sciences. And he's part of our Michigan Life Stage Environmental Exposure and Disease leadership team. Dr. Oman. Trish, thank you so much for introducing our program and for organizing our program. This is a wonderful opportunity to hear about the uh, Great Lakes Now Network and to see a very special film about chemicals in our environment. Chemicals are everywhere. In fact, for the longest time, chemical industry advertised better living through chemistry. And it's true. We've made remarkable advances in medicines, in foods, in products for industry. Many, many products involve chemistry. Chemistry is at the base of so many things of our modern society. But there are hazards, and there are risks that we need to learn about and that we need to act upon. Our Michigan Life, uh, our Michigan Center on Life Stage Environmental Exposures and Disease Risks at the university's School of Public Health is one of the big players nationally. And here in the state and in Detroit, we are very actively engaged with our community partners to understand the kinds of environmental chemicals that put our health at risk, the kinds of environmental chemicals that we need to measure and reduce in our water, in our air, in our foods, in our toys, on our toys, many, many exposures. And some of these problems have been discovered by lay people, people in the community, taking notice of problems and trying to figure out what could possibly explain why one child or one pregnant woman or one other person got ill while others didn't. And it turns out people are differentially susceptible and where it's a big part of what we study. We wanna be careful to understand who is most sensitive to some of these chemical exposures. That often means pregnant women, children, also workers who have much higher exposures under normal circumstances than people outside. And we have to have special protections. The Toxic Substance Control Act was designed 45 years ago and its amendments passed just five years ago under the leadership of Senator Frank Altenberg of New Jersey. I understand his wife is in the audience on this streamed show this evening. Welcome to you. Um, this uh, Lautenberg Amendment of the Toxic Substance Control Act is aimed at enhancing information, uh, motivating regulation, and engaging communities to protect our health and to protect and improve our, our economic processes that depend so much on chemistry. We need innovative solutions, and we need answers to the kinds of questions that most importantly come from people directly exposed in the community. That will be enhanced by our program this evening. 
We have many sponsors to thank for this program. Here you see the logos. I particularly want to mention our colleagues at Wayne State University and at University of California, San Francisco, who, like we, are funded by the National Institutes of Health, National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences for these environmental centers. And I would like to have a special shout out for the Ecology Center in Ann Arbor, which works deeply in the community and around consumer products, where everyone can take notice and make a difference. Let's now turn to Trish to introduce our program and welcome our outstanding panel of speakers. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Oman, for the, your welcome. Our team at the University of Michigan School of Public Health is very grateful to have partnered with Detroit Public Television and the Great Lakes Now Network, in addition to our other partners. And we hope you in the audience have had a chance to view the Great Lakes Now Emmy winning film, The Forever Chemicals. The film will continue to be available in the coming week, free and on demand for viewing. And if you haven't had a chance to watch it yet, I think you're gonna really enjoy it. The Forever Chemicals tells a really important story unfolding in Michigan about how industrial chemicals such as PFAS affect a community. And the same story has been happening across the country, but it is fully preventable. As public health professionals, we focus on prevention. We ask, how do these toxic substances gain access to the US market in the first place? And what can be done to improve safety? In 1976, President Ford signed into law the original Toxic Substance Control Act. This original TOSCA has been widely acknowledged, unfortunately, to be a weak and ineffective law, and widespread exposures and harms continue. Unlike pharmaceuticals, industrial and commercial chemicals are rarely tested before they enter commerce and reach the US market. Testing was available on less than 2% of the total manufactured chemicals. Under the 1976 TOSCA law, the US Environmental Protection Agency could not effectively regulate chemicals with documented adverse health effects, such as asbestos or solvents like methylene chloride, for example. Evidence and awareness of the harms, consumer boycotts, state action, and action by the European Union the REACH program led to pressures uh, to reform US policy. So in 2016, with bipartisan support, President Barack Obama signed the Frank R. Lautenberg Chemical Safety for the 21st Century Act. This reform law gave the US EPA new requirements to evaluate risks from chemicals in commerce and to gather necessary data. EPA has an enormous backlog with thousands of high production volume chemicals to evaluate. EPA must now make affirmative risk statements, shifting the burden of proof from communities to the manufacturers to show that their products don't pose unreasonable risks, especially to susceptible and highly exposed populations, such as children, pregnant women, workers, people with pre existing conditions. After five years, EPA must report on its progress back to Congress and the public. And that's why this anniversary is so important. Unfortunately, the previous administration has not fully utilized the science or these new authorities. There's also a backlog of chemicals without data. And so many types of chemicals in products that we use every day, we don't understand fully their impact. So how are these chemicals affecting our communities and the health of susceptible groups? We are fortunate to have an expert panel with us that I'll be introducing in just a moment to help us understand these issues. But first, let's take a look at the Emmy-winning documentary, The Forever Chemicals. These powerful chemicals are in products you use every day. They're in the soil, they could be in your water, or even your blood. They're called PFAS, and they've been linked to deadly health problems. It's as serious as a heart attack, it truly is. It killed my husband, it took away my property values. I have absolutely nothing left. It's taken everything from me. What are PFAS, where are they, and what can be done to protect you and your family? For more information, visit greatlakesnow.org. So I will now ask each of our panelists to say a little bit about themselves. We are so fortunate to have with us the film producer, Sandra Savoda. Let's start with you.
Hi, thanks so much for having us and putting this event on and letting us continue to spread the word about the forever chemicals and how they're in, they're in our environment. I'm Sandra Swoboda, the Program Director of Great Lakes Now. And what we do, the, we're an initiative at Detroit Public Television. We have a monthly show that airs on PBS stations around the region and in Canada. And we have a website where we have daily news and information. That includes a lot of stories about PFAS because they continue to be in the news. So thanks for letting us uh, get this event going where people can ask questions and hear live from experts on, on up-to-date information and hopefully get some answers to the concerns that are out there. Wonderful, let's turn to Professor Tracy Woodruff. Hello, everybody. I'm Tracy Woodruff. I'm a professor at the University of California, San Francisco, and director of the Program on Reproductive Health and the Environment and the Earth Center. And our goal is to do the research that's so critical for community groups as well as the government to understand what are the chemicals that people are exposed to, the sources of exposure, and importantly, how they may influence health and the actions that can be taken to prevent them. We are very concerned about looking at exposures that occur during vulnerable periods of development, so pregnancy and early childhood, because A, that's a time when these chemicals can have their most profound effects, and B, if we intervene to prevent exposures to our most vulnerable, we'll end up protecting the whole population. Wonderful. We're also joined tonight by the Sierra Club organizer, Justin Awainu. Justin. Hi, thank you so much for having me. My name is Justin Anwenu. I'm an environmental justice organizer with the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club focuses on environmental issues throughout the state and throughout the country. I focus primarily on air quality and water quality. And we do that by bringing together members throughout the state to advocate, uh, whether it be at city, um, the city uh, level, city council, or at the state level, or with our state government um, at the agency level making sure that our laws protect not just our environment, but also our communities and our neighborhoods. And that's why we think, you know, advocating, um, you know, to make sure that our air and that our water is safe is so important. It affects our home values, it affects our health, it affects our communities. And we're excited today to, to, talk, to, to talk to you and to talk to others about why this work is so important. Wonderful, well, welcome everyone. So I'd like to turn to Sandy. The Forever Chemical documentary tells us a powerful story about how environmental chemicals can affect our health. Please tell us how you got interested in making this film. Yes, well, we started working on it in the fall of 2018. Uh, I was brand new to Great Lakes Now, and Rob Green, who is now our supervising producer, was not an employee yet, and uh, but he was interested in producing. He had worked on long-form documentaries and nonfiction TV, and we had we knew we needed to make a documentary that winter, and we looked at what was in the news and what we felt like had a story to tell that people hadn't heard yet. They had not heard about these chemicals around our region, and we fortunately had the cooperation of a reporter named Garrett Ellison, who put us in touch with the people that are in the film and worked with us to bring this documentary to audiences. Uh, since then, it's continued to air at events, uh, which we're very, very grateful for. And we've been able to do some updates in our program, our monthly program, and on our website as PFAS continues to be in the news. So uh, the short answer is it was really a combination of what was important for people to know and on the practical side of making television, we had Sandy uh, Winstelt and the McNaughtons who were willing to tell us their, their stories uh, to go public with some very, uh, really emotional and difficult situations. Yeah, it's been a really powerful film to watch. Tracy, let's turn to you. So as a research scientist at UCSF, you've been a leader in discovering how chemicals affect our health. And this film is telling a story of one important class of chemicals, um, a very highly persistent uh, set of chemicals, but it's really only the tip of the iceberg in terms of the number of industrial chemicals that we can come into contact with. Can you tell us what do we know about chemicals in our health? Well, I think the thing that, and I, this was a great um, introduction, both Trish and Gil that you did, that is both illuminating about the film, but also disturbing is that these, there was this aha moment discovery where unfortunately these families found out that they were exposed to these chemicals and they had very tragic 
health situations occur that made them suspect that exposure to these chemicals could be likely in those in their in the health effects and that i think is really a cautionary tale about how much we have left to do about these chemicals so pfos is just one group of chemicals though it is a class of 9,000 chemicals, even though the film just focuses on just a few, and we only really are able to even monitor or evaluate a subset of those 9,000 chemicals, yet we know they're being manufactured or used uh, both in the U.S. and globally. So what this means is that we uh, are doing a lot of work. We're doing work at UCSF. I know Michigan and other academics are doing work to try and identify all these various thousands of chemicals. So in the United States, they talk about tens of thousands of chemicals, more than 40,000 of chemicals are registered on the Toxic Substances Control under the Toxic Substances Control Act. But a paper just came out last year that says that there's 350,000 chemicals in commerce that are registered globally. And um, you know, it's really hard for us academic universities to keep up with this. We really need the government to intervene and put their resources to um, uh, holding the industry accountable to tell us where these chemicals are being used, what they are, and importantly, making sure that they're not toxic before it's too late for families like those in the film. Yeah. So, Justin, um, working as a community organizer, what are you hearing from communities about their concerns? So I think three concerns. The, the first is that there's a concern on, on what we don't know. And I think the frustration is that constantly communities are having to prove that they've been harmed, uh, but businesses and corporations and industrial polluters are, are never having to prove that what they're doing is safe. And I think just fundamentally that burden of proof needs to be shifted. Uh, I think the second concern is that government hasn't been as responsive as it needs to be. Uh, there are certainly capacity and funding concerns um, at the state level. Uh, there, there have been efforts through the Michigan PFOS Action Response Team uh, that a community resident that I work closely with, Teresa Landrum, sits on that's working to address the threat of PFOS at the state level. Uh, but they're just constantly, I think, is a, is a catch-up game that our government regulators are, are playing. And I think the, the third concern it's just about how transparent or a lack of transparency uh, from industry on what chemicals are being used and on potential harm. You know, decades after the fact, we often learn um, about chemicals that industries knew were harmful uh, that they just didn't tell the public. And so I think that, you know, um, companies being allowed to hide their chemical formulas from scrutiny by claiming that they're trade secrets, things like that. I think are just so frustrating because it, it reinforces just the heavy burden of proof that's put on community residents, on researchers, on government officials to prove um, harm. When we know the harm is there, we know the impact is there. I think the last thing I'll say is that, you know, pollution, uh, toxic exposure has a cost. I think what I love about this film is that it, it shows the cost upfront and personal. Uh, if you're living next to a polluting facility, your home is not going to be worth as much as it would be otherwise. You're going to be paying more money for health care. If your child is going uh, and learning in an, an environment that's not healthy, they're probably not going to be performing as well as they would otherwise. And so I think, you know, what I hear from community residents and from researchers and from other folks that I work with is that, you know, this exposure, this pollution has a human cost that that is going um, unaddressed and is is going unmet uh, by our government agencies and government officials. So I'm hoping that this film is, is something that uh, motivates people to, to get involved and to join with others who are feeling the same way. Yeah, the human cost is, is definitely a concern that we hear a lot about. So industrial chemicals can impact our health over time. So let's take a look at a scene from the Forever Chemicals uh, with the story of Sandy and Joel. You sit and wonder, and you play back every time you said, stop drinking so much pop. You should drink water, it's better for you. Um, you wonder how much this affected his liver. What we keep hearing from scientists is there's no clear, definitive connection between PFAS and disease process. Um, but it just makes you wonder. The effects of PFOS on human health are just beginning to be understood. Those who have been exposed are frustrated by the uncertainty, and what we do know isn't encouraging. There are things that are certain. Um, it is certain that you should not drink PFOS. 
It is certain that it is not good for you. It is certain that it bioaccumulates. It is certain that you will carry it around in your system forever once you have it in there. Those are not in dispute. Uh, it is um, also certain on the, the property value side that a house that has PFAS contamination is, is worth less than one that doesn't. And so there may be arguments about matters of degree on these things, but there really are no legitimate arguments that what has happened to the residents of Rockford is wrong and should have never happened. It's a really powerful story. So Tracy, turning to you, you work with a lot of doctors and clinicians. What do you hear from them about their concerns with their patients? Well, I think that the story that's told in this film is illustrative of the story of many patients have with their doctor when they have some type of unexplained disease. I mean, even the founding of our program was based on an interaction between a patient who was um, seeking treatment for infertility. She had had multiple unsuccessful rounds of um, IVF and she was talking to her doctor and she asked the doctor if she knew if because she grew up near Love Canal, which was um, a contaminated waste site in the uh, New York area. It's like the first discovered contaminated waste site in the 1970s and she had grown up near there and she wanted to know if growing up near there caused her to be uh, infertile when she was an adult. Um, and this doctor was very honest with her and told her she didn't know. And she knew that other doctors didn't know that either because at the time, and this was in um, the early 2000s, doctors were not really, particularly reproductive health professionals, were not getting the type of training that they needed to understand how environmental chemicals could be in, in, influencing their patient's health. And I think that one of the reasons we've been so successful in partnering with um, our clinical and healthcare professional partners is because they're seeing so many growing chronic diseases in the population, whether it's um, uh, pregnancy outcomes, infertility, we know sperm counts are declining, um, they're seeing challenges in childhood, like you know, developmental outcomes are increasing, obesity, diabetes, all of these are happening in such a short time period, they have to be driven by external factors. And industrial chemical or chemicals in commerce, um, as you mentioned in the beginning, have grown in manufacturing and use. And they are, um, many of these chemicals are linked to these chronic health conditions we see increasing. So this is making doctors pause and say, you know, we need to be more engaged in both research, clinical engagement with our patients, but also, also be on the front lines of advocating for the health of our patients. And also they've been, um, we do a lot of work with American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. They've been very conscientious about recognizing the potential or the role of environmental exposures and their contribution to health inequities. Great, it's good to see the medical community stepping forward. So Sandy, from your perspective, what did you learn from the communities and the families involved? I think I, it was really reinforced to me the power of family and community in this. Uh, Sandy Winstalt, for people who have seen the film, lost her husband, Joel. So she lives alone in this neighborhood. And then the McNaughtons live a little ways away, but between them, uh, between both of their, their households, they've come together with a lot of people in the neighborhood who were really bonded over the horror of learning uh, that they've got these chemicals, not only in their houses and their, and their water, but also in themselves, in their bodies, in their blood and in their children's blood. And so to hear the stories about how people really bonded, not of course, over the terrible experience that they've had, but also what they could do about it. And there's a scene in the film where you see the women um, wine and water Wednesdays, which unfortunately that was paused for the last year with pandemic, but they are all still working. You know, they're sort of accidental activists. They not only took the opportunity to come together and share their story of surviving with the contamination, but also they move forward. You know, they're, they're looking to change laws. They're looking to be activists. Sandy Winstelt has been, has been recognized by the EPA for her efforts. And, you know, she's a psychologist, you know, she works in the mental health field. She's not a lobbyist. She's not a politician, but they've really, from their experience, tried to do something positive from it while they live with the uncertainty for the rest of their lives and the rest of their children's lives. Yeah, this family just showed tremendous courage in telling their story. And, you know, it's just a tragedy what happened to them. 
but it also uh, does bring forward the importance of biomonitoring. Um, so let's let's see a scene from the film. In April of 2016, Jack was born. He had an immense appetite for water. He was thirsty all the time. You know how to drink out of a sippy cup now? How did that happen? He was breastfed too. He was getting everything he needed, but uh, it turns out he was getting lots of PFAS at the same time. Tests showed almost 2,000 parts per trillion of PFAS in the McNaughton's water, nearly 30 times more than the EPA's health advisory level of 70 parts per trillion. As soon as they could, Tobin and Seth had Jack's blood tested. The results? 484,000 parts per trillion, more than 100 times the national average. He's the highest level of PFAS that we know right now of any child in the United States. He gets sick more often and his vaccin vaccinations haven't worked. What we know, and this is true across the board, whether it's you know mercury or lead or some other contaminant, is that children are the most susceptible because of their developing systems. And so that's also true in PFAS. You know, when you see this film and, and the powerful story that this family is telling, um, it just, it really, you see the impact of chemical exposures on this family. And it makes you ask, um, Shouldn't we prevent, be preventing these harms? So Tracy, a question for you. How did a chemical like this make its way into commerce without adequate health testing? Well, I think you alluded, I answered that question at the beginning of the uh, show, Trish, which is when the, uh, so basically chemicals on the marketplace were completely unregulated until 1976 when the first law, the Toxic Substance Control Act was signed into law. Uh, but unfortunately, the way that it was written made it extremely difficult for the government to um, collect data on uh, chemicals, particularly chemicals that were already existing on the marketplace. So there were tens of thousands of chemicals that were already existing on the marketplace, and they were what was called grandfathered in in 1976. They were allowed to be out on about in the market, in commerce, in your products under I suppose it was an assumption they were safe, but really it was uh, the law was set up to make it extremely difficult to collect the data and to regulate the chemicals. So as you said, asbestos was a chemical that EPA did try to regulate, but because of the burden of proof that was set up in the law at the time, the courts rejected their um, case and EPA pretty much um, did not do any regulation of existing chemicals for multiple years, even when they, uh, discovered that, so that I just want to note that the industry knew that PFOA and PFOS was toxic. Uh, we have industry documents that are in our library at UCSF that show they knew the toxicity of PFOA and PFOS um, easily 40 years before the public knew. So in the 1970s, they were documented saying this is a toxic chemical. Um, but the problem is there was no requirement to have that made public to for us to know about and for the government to act on um, well into the 2000s. So the amendment is helpful to at least give EPA the ability to require the data to understand toxicity and to um, be able to regulate more easily without the burden of proof being on um, EPA to prove that toxicity. Yeah. So testing is really important. The film also brings forward uh, water quality testing and some treatment methods that are available for these particular chemicals. Uh, but prevention is a cheaper way to go. Um, so the film also featured uh, legislation that US Senator Gary Peters was trying to introduce um, from Michigan um, at the time. Uh, however, federal legislation can be very difficult to obtain. And we have the 2016 Tosca amendments. Um, with bipartisan support for uh, giving EPA some new authorities to hopefully do something to help prevent these situations. So Justin, let's bring you into the conversation here. So after five years, what's your thoughts about how Tosca is doing? Right, well, you're, you're absolutely right that getting new legislation has, has been extremely difficult. I know there was the PFAS Action Act, which passed the House in 2019, and that would have protected drinking water from PFAS by requiring the EPA to create you know, better drinking water standards. Hopefully the Senate is interested in moving with more urgency. I will say that in 2014, there were amendments made in the aftermath of the West Virginia chemical spill, which resulted in over 300,000 residents uh, losing water 
because of a chemical spill. Now there were amendments, common sense amendments that were made after that because of the outrage and because there was an emergency. Um, but absent that sort of outcry, absent that sort of emergency, it's been incredibly difficult to see action on the federal level. The one exception has been uh, the 2016 amendments that were made that actually had some pretty good provisions, including uh, requiring you know, the EPA to evaluate uh, existing chemicals, uh, requiring chemical assessments, um, increasing public transparency, and then the five-year report back that you mentioned that's due this summer on the progress that's been made. I think there have been a couple of, of problems uh, with, with those efforts. I think the first is that tribal and indigenous communities in a lot of cases have actually been left out. So um, the rights of tribal nations haven't been given uh, the same sort of rights as uh, states have been given to receive information from businesses on their chemicals so that they can better protect the health of res residents. I'll also say that you know there's a problem with just the scale of how many chemicals are out there. Thousands of chemicals, but only a couple of dozen have actually been evaluated. Um, the EPA started with you know the most harmful chemicals, the most headline-worthy chemicals, but there are thousands that we just don't have enough information on. And so there are opportunities for the public to get involved, to offer public comment uh, that people should avail themselves to. Um, to make sure that our communities are being supported. Uh, this work does not happen without the input of the public, without public outcry, without political pressure. Um, so just making sure that people get involved um, in that process, especially with the five-year report back is, is really important. Great. So states have been active in this area, absent some federal um, activities. So, so Tracy, um, some states uh, and consumer campaigns have stepped in when there's been an absence in federal action. Um, and other attempts to ban substances like phthalates uh, have also had some issues um, where we take one thing off the market but get something else on. Can you give an example? Yeah, I mean, I think phthalates is an excellent example and PFOS is too. So um, phthalates are a group of chemicals. They're used in plastics. They're also used as um, to convey scent. So they're found highly in cosmetics and personal care products. They're also found in various types of plastic, um, uh, uh, plastic materials. So the vinyl flooring, um, toys, they can make a hard plastic soft. And phthalates also have this other feature about them, which is that they interfere with your hormone system. They decrease levels of testosterone. So you can imagine this is actually very important during pregnancy because testosterone a is important just in general for male health, but it's particularly important during fetal development because it is important for male proper male reproductive health development, the proper male reproductive development. So there was a, a number of studies showing that uh, both women had higher exposures to phthalates because it's found in many um, different types of personal care products or was certain types were found in many personal care products. And also that um, the exposures that occur during important developmental windows, so during the prenatal period or even in early childhood could have um, lifelong consequences. So the state of California, actually Europe also did this too, state of California banned certain phthalates um, certain ones in the class. And then actually there was a ban federally of certain phthalates, um, uh, some of them, and that was very successful. There was also some market-based campaigns where uh, environmental health and public health groups uh, pressured the um, cosmetics industry to take certain phthalates out of their products. That was also very successful. And what we saw because of the ban and because of this market-based campaign that the levels of certain types of phthalates went down in the U.S. population. That is a great success. The flip to this whole thing is that actually they were replaced with other phthalates that while the phthalates that were banned were going down, this other replacement phthalate was going up and we actually didn't don't have as much information about those health effects. Of course, you can like play catch up, but you can see where the problem's going, right? You have this, some people call it, it's regrettable substitution or maybe it's whack-a-mole or anyway, conveyor belt of chemicals. The problem is, is that if you don't have a comprehensive approach to addressing all the chemicals on the market, you just get this substitution problem. So you may not be really improving health overall because you're just swapping out one 
potentially bad actor for another. Yeah, regrettable substitution is really an issue. And also looking at classes of chemicals can help speed the process by which we're evaluating the risks from chemicals. So Sandy, let's bring you into the conversation. So there's been more Great Lakes Now reporting um, showing um, how just this one class of PFAS chemicals are present in a, a wide array of products. Um, and one of your fellow reporters took the story a little bit further. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, in our monthly show, I mentioned that we've done some updates on PFAS and I think we could replicate the Forever Chemicals documentary in communities across the world, not just the Great Lakes region, uh, the states and Canada, but really internationally. Uh, so we've done some of those, but then we uh, partnered as we do with a group called Type Investigations. They fund freelance reporters and they were in touch with Tom Perkins. He's a reporter in the Detroit area. He writes a lot about the food industry being a food reporter. And he also started writing about PFAS. So he kind of put the two things together and thought, hmm, I've been writing about these PFAS chemicals and what they mean in communities, what they mean on a large public health scale. And I've been writing about food, much of which comes in these takeout containers or is prepared with various, you know, you'll see parchment paper for sure. And so he thought, I wonder how much exposure I have. And so we worked with him, we filmed, he wrote a story and he went through the process of testing his own blood as well as one of his cats. Uh, and so we called this segment PFAS in the house. And um, he also not only did the blood testing but household items as well. So we followed it through. Uh, and so here's a piece of that story as well. The more I reported on the issue and the more I learned what products they're in, I started to look around my apartment and go, my God, there are dozens of things in here that are sometimes made with the chemicals. Am I getting a slow drip of poison from, from these things? And it's not just me. My cat Ling Ling probably encounters a lot of the same chemicals that I do, and she only weighs about nine pounds. We're in Hamtramck, a small city surrounded by Detroit, and the problem is PFAS a family of chemicals known for their water and stain repellent qualities that are used in everything from waterproof shoes, to clothing, to bike chain lube, even food packaging. I wanted to know how much PFAS Ling Ling and I are getting into our bodies and our daily lives, so I made a plan. What we're gonna do is test a bunch of different products around my house that are sometimes made with the chemicals and see if they have PFAS in them. One of the main ways people ingest the chemicals is through their water. And we're gonna test the uh, tap water as well and, and then get my blood checked out. And Ling Ling's getting her blood checked too. Industry has just introduced chemical after chemical and they don't provide that information to the public. Yeah, this clip really brings home how widespread uh, chemical exposure can be and it's in objects all around us that we're in very close proximity with every single day, and yet so few are tested for, for health impacts. So the Forever Chemical film um, also made a connection between the environment um, and chemicals and our health. So Sandy, I'm hoping that you can um, give us some ideas of what are some of your key takeaways from making the film. Yeah, I, you know, personally, I think I sort of swing between wanting to do all of our work around this issue and being a little hopeless. And, and I've heard that from other people as they've, they've learned more about PFAS chemicals, both, you know, friends and family and people in the media even. You know, it's, it is really complicated. And that's why I love doing events like this, where we hear from the community organizers and the scientists and the doctors and even the politicians sometimes about what can be done. So I do think, you know, there are one key takeaway was there are politicians who care um, not to give an endorsement, but Senator Gary Peters was involved in the film. He came out to the studios on a Sunday <laughs> on his day off, but we filmed that interview. Uh, at the DPTV studios on an off day for everybody because he made the time to talk about these issues. I spoke with his office a few days ago and he's planning on some additional legislation uh, as early as this week in Congress that would hopefully at least take some action towards, I don't know exactly what's going to be in it, but there is a bill also introduced this session that gets at firefighters and the exposure that they've had from the from the foams and, and the substances there. So I think, you know, the first key takeaway is what everybody got was that it was 
that it's everywhere. And then the second key takeaway is to kind of stay on it. What, how can we learn more? What can we do? And within our own jobs, how can we continue to tell the story? It's not our job in, in TV to write legislation, but it is our job to keep the public updated on stories and tell various sides of, of the issues. And so it's, um, we haven't been able to uh, square away any interviews with industry yet. I should point out we've asked uh, part of the story where Tom Perkins got all of his household items tested. We reached out to all of these industries involved and we got one response from Procter & Gamble who disputed the chemicals being, the chemicals that were found being classified as PFAS or PFOA. So uh, the scientists don't debate that one, but industry sometimes does. And then also in the, the Forever Chemicals long form documentary, we reached out to the company in there and in, involved there as well and did not get a response. So. Uh, you know, my key takeaway is there's certainly more reporting to be done, and, and we're back at it at Great Lakes now at Detroit Public Television. Great. I'm hoping you're going to bring us um, continuations in this story and, and additional solutions as well for our communities. So, Tracy, um, let's turn to you. So, um, if you could leave us with some key recommendations for how to better use the science in chemical policy, what would be at the top of your list? Hmm, it's kind of like a trick question. You are like better use the existing science or better use the law to get the science so that we can know where these chemicals are in all these different products and how they're used and their potential for um, how they may influence health and that the tools that we have to evaluate those health risks are up to current standards, scientific standards, so that we can identify those risks and get them out of the marketplace or out of our out of our homes so that we can improve health. Great. So Justin, what are some of the ways that people can get involved on this issue and make a difference um, and reduce toxic chemical exposures for everyone? Right. So I, I would just first off say that, you know, at a state level with the Michigan PFOS response team, um, and at a federal level with the PFOS Action Act, which was sponsored by a lot of Michigan delegation members, shows just how far ahead Michigan is compared to a lot of other states on PFOS and on these chemicals. But it also shows that we're behind um, as a country, as a nation on, on where we need to go. And so I would just say get involved. Uh, the public comment period, I would, I would say, is a great place to get started on just explaining how important it is for government to take these chemicals seriously and to uh, increase capacity and funding so that we can get the science we need. I'll also say that there are great organizations, the Sierra Club, of course, as a, as a member that I would say is a great organization to get involved in. The Ecology Center as well is doing great work. The Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition is doing great work with environmental justice communities. And I guess I'll just say lastly that, you know, Christy McGillivray, our Sierra Club political director, always just stresses the importance of protecting our democracy and how important um, and how connected our democracy is to our ability to fight for our environment and to fight for environmental justice. So I would just say that it's really important to keep in mind how important our democracy is, whether it's lobbying reform, transparency, pushing back on the corporations that we're finding have, have oftentimes lied to us about the chemicals that they're using. It's just really important to keep in mind how important our democracy is, how important being fully engaged as citizens is, or, um, and, and uh, pushing back on all these chemicals that, that we're being exposed to. So get involved with the public comment period, get involved with great organizations and stay engaged with our democracy as well. Great, staying involved is really important. Um, as we mentioned, there's a lot of different chemicals, so there's gonna be a pretty complex process uh, likely ahead. But what we do know is that the environment uh, does affect your health, chemicals in the environment can affect your health, and as we've seen, it can be um, in the outdoor environment and also in our homes where we're spending a lot of time th these days, it, it seems. Um, it's especially important for our children, uh, for at-risk populations such as pregnant women, people in the workplace um, as well face special challenges with respect to this issue. Firefighters were brought up as a, a key um, group. There's a lot of um, additional types of workplace exposures that can be very important and contribute to health outcomes that can be avoided. And, and I think that's the positive thing in all of this is that uh, these kinds of chemical exposures are completely preventable. Uh, there's so many things in our health that we can't do anything about, but this is one where we can really solve it. And so we need to really make sure that our 
laws are put to work for all of us um, and that we're doing everything that we can to be sure that we have a safe and healthy environment for everyone. So thank you to our, our panel for your great questions. We're gonna now um, uh, move towards uh, taking some questions from our live audience. Uh, so we've got a couple different ways on a Facebook page and uh, other ways that the audience can give us their questions. And so we've got a team behind the scenes taking a look at some of those chat functions and uh, we're gonna be asking the panelists your questions next. So please be providing those questions to us at this time. Um, so we've got one uh, question here. Michael from Michigan asks, military families uh, face risks from chemicals at military bases. Military bases have water pollution from firefighting activities and using industrial solvents for years. What are some of the ways that the Tosca law might be used to protect military personnel and their families? Um, Justin or Tracy, did you wanna start? This work with the Children's Environmental Health Initiative, which used to be at the University of Michigan, ended up down south. And one of our jobs was uh, running a registry that tracked the exposures and the public health impact of a hurricane that hit uh, many years ago. And I've seen similar registries, whether it's the 9-11 registry uh, that, that ended up providing the data and the research necessary to get 9-11 first responders healthcare. Uh, there's a burn pit exposure registry being run through the VA. Personally, I'd like to see similar protections um, made for military families that have been facing so many of these chemicals on, on a military basis. And so I would just say politically, it's just really important for military families to get involved, um, to try to work with researchers and, and academia to track a lot of these exposures um, so, that the, so that we can build some of that broad and bipartisan support that's necessary to, to get the relief and the healthcare um, that's, that so many people need now because of what they were exposed to on these bases. Great, Tracy, did you wanna add something? Yeah. Oh, there I am. Yeah, first of all, I think this is really important. I mean, these people serve our country and we deserve to you know, treat them with when they're in a time of need and they have been exposed in many bases across the country, like this person said, solvents or PFAS. And so what we need is for the, um, to allow EPA to do their assessments of the potential health effects un, um, influenced by those that have something at stake. And so the DOD would be helpful for them to allow EPA to do their assessments without any type of interference, which has happened in the past. So I think we really owe it to these people who have many really very sad stories about exposures and health effects that have happened because of exposures on military bases. Yeah. We're getting a number of questions about the European approach. Um, the European have Europeans have a program called REACH. Um, so I'm gonna combine a couple of these questions. Um, so Barbara from Oregon State, um, John from Ann Arbor, uh, Stephen, who's a Sierra Club member, uh, ask um, a few questions about the international scene. So what is the prospect for implementing a chemical management program in the US similar to the European Union's REACH program in which industry must prove a chemical is safe before a chemical is put into commerce? Uh, and what are some of the best features of the European approach? Tracy, do you wanna tell us a little bit about that? So, yeah, I'll t I can talk a little bit about that and probably Justin has some things to say too. Um, so essentially the Europeans have approach which is no data, no market. Um, the industry is required to produce certain types of data about their chemicals probably doesn't cover every health effect we're concerned about, but they do have to um, evaluate chemicals for certain types of toxicity. They do have to evaluate it for cancer and reproductive toxicity. If a chemical has that type of health effect, it goes through, either goes off the market or it is used under some type of restricted use. I would say that one of the features that's different between Europe and the United States uh, well, there's a couple features, obviously, there's many, not just a couple. But one thing I think is important is that the chemicals, the industry does do the risk assessments in Europe. So I think in the U.S. it's better to have a, a government agency do it because they are responsive to the public. However, in Europe, they do have a requirement that certain types of data must be produced. 
and they've taken many chemicals have been um, taken off the marketplace because of this law. That is not the case in the United States. And actually this Tosca, that to me is one of the areas where it has potentially one of the, uh, one area that's a, a big weakness is that there's not a requirement for certain types of data in order to understand a chemical's toxicity. And I know there's arguments about, oh, well, there's so many different types of toxicity, but there could be some baseline information that we need for these chemicals. And actually, we don't even require right now in the United States things like, and this is something we ran into when we're doing some studies, is like a chemical standard, which means basically the chemical so that when somebody goes to do biomonitoring or testing, they're able to purchase that chemical and they can actually do the biomonitoring or environmental monitoring or whatever. And actually just recently, um, one of the, the manufacturers of a certain type of PFAS told a chemical supplier that they had to stop um, they had to stop providing this particular standard for one of the PFAS because they didn't want anyone to be able to test it or measure it. That's a huge flaw in the United States. We can correct it. It is possible to require these things under TSCA, but there's a lot of decisions that are left up to the agency and whoever is in charge of the agency. And we're hoping that in this administration, they will take their responsibilities very seriously and implement TSCA to its fullest extent. Justin, did you want to comment about a pathway to reform um, to approach the European um, standards anytime soon? Yeah, I'll just say that, you know, whether it's tobacco or climate change in our country, at least we've had a history of industry lying and suppressing data. So I fully support, you know, um, certainly the government doing the testing and not industry. Um, and I also just think that, again, our model is backwards. And I think that has a lot to do with just the state of our democracy, the state of, you know, a lack of lobbying reform, the importance of advocacy. You know, we've had moments, very brief moments, whether it's seatbelts or removing lead and paint where, you know, consumers have advocated for more protections and it's been successful. I hope we see a resurgence of that sort of advocacy, but absent uh, that advocacy, we won't get to the European model that is much better. I think overall, we just need to do a better job of showing that this chemical exposure, uh, pollution, all of this has a cost. It's just not being taken up by the corporations that can afford it. You know, when someone has to pay money for healthcare or has a lower life expectancy, that is a cost. If someone is not learning as well in school because of the chemicals they've been exposed to um, as a child, that has a cost. So I just I just really hope that that people get involved and can explain um, that that we as consumers, as citizens, as people are bearing the cost, not the corporations that oftentimes can afford it and then oftentimes know of the damage that the chemicals are doing, just are, are cutting corners and being cheap about their process. So, but it will require a, an enormous amount of advocacy of making sure that we're protecting our democracy, of mobilizing um, to get any of these reforms done. Okay, we've got another um, question, uh, this time for Sandy. Uh, Natalie from the University of Michigan would like to know, from your reporting, do you see the Biden administration poised to contribute to advancing community trust in government and inclusion um, in the process? Uh, that's a big question. Uh, I would say partially yes. You've seen executive orders that de deal with environmental justice within the EPA. You've seen executive orders related to climate change. Uh, just the words climate change are now being spoken by people who work for federal agencies. No one will go on camera and tell us this, but I promise you people have told us uh, off the record that climate change was not something that they could address or have at the top of websites or release data and research on in the last four years. So there's a change there, a willing, a signaling a willingness to be more open about data that's there, uh, taking competing interests from uh, industry as well. So I think, you know, we have not seen movement particularly on PFAS that would have prevented the contaminations and the, the problems for the families in the Forever Chemicals film but there's at least a hope that, and, and a signal from some of the early steps that, uh, that the communities might be uh, raised uh, in profile in whose considerations there are. 
Um, I kind of wanted to go back to the advocacy part, if I could, for just a moment. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I loved what was said at kind of the macro level, but I think, you know, for individuals, I don't think we can ever underestimate the power of someone's voice. I mean, we would not have had a film without the individuals in it. You politicians, I think, are most moved by people's individual stories. And so it's great that we have the internet for communication and organizing sometimes where people can click and have a petition automatically sent, have an email auto-generated, but also for people who have a story to tell, don't be afraid to tell it and make it personal and you know, don't write 50 pages, but a couple of pages of a, of a heartfelt, accurate, documented story is for someone who's considering a policy, a scientific policy they don't know a lot about, people are always looking for those human stories. It's, it's the similarity we have in television between politicians, I guess, is that we want that human story. We want a face and a name to be able to tell that. Statistics are really important, but that's really what moves people. That's why you showed our film, not because we put data tables up. And so, you know, if you're looking to communicate your story and affect change in society, make sure you're telling your story. It, it's important to be part of groups and all of that, but also be willing to come forward as well. It's an excellent point. So we've got a few other questions where people are interested in what's happening in Washington, DC. So Laura from Portage Lake wonders, um, and this might be for Justin, do you see any signals in Washington, DC that more sweeping substantive policy change is possible? What's the landscape like? Yeah, I mentioned the PFAS Action Act, which passed the House in 2019, which is a, a great step. And a lot of that legislation was led by, you know, our Michigan delegation. I I am just personally not as excited about the, the prospect of, of moving towards a European model or, or our ability to do so rather. Um, I think that a lot of people have been sharing stories about PFAS on military bases that's been moving uh, on a bipartisan level and, and moving for legislators um, to get involved. But I, I just am, I'm not as excited about where we are in terms of just shifting the burden of proof from industry, uh, from communities having to prove that they've been harmed to industry having to prove that what they're doing is safe. I hope that with, as was said, with people sharing their story, not just statistics, that that can change. Um, there has been progress, especially on PFAS at the House uh, level, but we still have a, a long way to go, I think. Yeah. Um, so we got a related question. Um, how can we vastly accelerate the process of testing potentially toxic chemicals, especially all the thousands of legacy chemicals that were not required to be proven safe before used? Tracy, any thoughts about how to accelerate the testing? Yeah, I mean, I think we have a lot of, I think one of the challenges that we have and this is just, I mean, I'm gonna speak from the science side, but it washes into the policy side, which is that we just don't have the investment in, let's just say we have this model in the United States, which is, I agree with Justin, is, is pretty much where we're gonna be for a while. Um, but we just don't have the investment by the federal government in understanding how exposures to these chemicals in commerce and how they influence health. I mean, if you look, just look at research dollars like from the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences and compare it to the research doll overall for NIH budget, I think it's less than 10%. It's just a fraction, even though this problem is definitely bigger than the percent of money that's being spent. So I think the first thing is we just need more dollars because there is actually a lot of technology and science that we can do to really accelerate a, trying to figure out where these chemicals are, since the government's not requiring that, and B, um, using more um, methods that have been developed to more rapidly the computational toxicology approaches. So we have work that we're doing, for example, at UCSF, where we can run chemicals through systems that test for reproductive health effects. I mean, we use a yeast or a fly or whatever model, but it is possible, and we can use, um, we have a lot of information about the chemical structures and and um, how they're um, different pieces about it that we can do different types of artificial intelligence, machine learning that will help us really vastly accelerate our understanding about the potentials for both exposures and toxicity. But it costs money to do that. 
So you can imagine if you put all the money that we have into like our mapping software, like if think about your Google map, right? And your street level, that all was like cars driving around, taking all these pictures, pulling all the satellite data. I mean, that was a lot of investment of resources to create this fine grain information. It's not inconceivable to do that. It just requires resources to do that. So I guess I think it's possible for us to get a, a little bit farther ahead on this problem. But, you know, if they're not going to change the policies to require them, like Justin said, then we have to get more resources in to really accelerate what we know about these chemicals or lack of address all these, like, I mean, just ginormous data gaps. I, it's just like when you work in this field, you just cannot believe how much we don't know. Um, I'm just going to say, we submitted a grant on breast cancer in the environment. And do you know how many years we've been studying breast cancer in the environment? And we still don't know anything because we haven't been putting enough money into it to really know. I think it's really tragic, actually. There's so many data gaps and, and so much work left to do. So we've got a, a couple other questions um, uh, thinking about uh, the way that the community might be involved in providing information or the way that the community um, comes at this, this issue. So Margaret from Texas noted, the people impacted in the film were informed by lawyers about their exposure, not the local public health officials. Um, later, the community members formed their own support group. We saw a little bit of that. Um, is the Tosca legislation written in a way to promote community involvement so people can get more involved? Uh, maybe Sandy, uh, this could be for you. How has your reporting and filmmaking been received by the broader Great Lakes area and decision makers and how is it affecting community involvement? Sure. Well, I think, you know, first of all, it's events like this that have been really rewarding to be a part of. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we did that film almost two years ago now, and it's, there have been a few updates, but, but it's still an issue. It's still in different communities around the country, as we're seeing the audience, you've mentioned Oregon and Texas, people are starting to do more testing and find what they have. You know, Michigan, we did that piece in Michigan. We were able to do it two years ago because testing had been done. Uh, Sandy Winstelt lived in an area that actually had an armory. And so that original water testing was part of the military uh, effort to determine what exposure, what contamination had been around military sites. It turns out that her contamination actually came from a company. Um, and so actually an update on that is there's been a, there's been a proposal by the company to do uh, some tree planting in the area that um, would filter some of that groundwater. And I don't think I can say her response uh, on this program in the language uh, to do that. But anyway, the other, the McNaughton's were part of another community uh, that was tested. And you know, another issue with the testing is it's not like you turn on your faucet and you get the final number. The, when, you, when you're talking about well water, as we are in both of these cases, those numbers can change as the water table changes. And so as water is flushing through or there's more groundwater absor absorbed, um, some days may look better than others. And so it actually took some time before, in Sandy's case, uh, they did a series of readings. Um, but but you're, the listener, is, uh, the viewer is correct. The McNaughton's actually found out from an attorney because they knew uh, that there was, there was contamination in that area. It had not come from a public health authority at all. Um, we have an example in Michigan just this week. It's in the Traverse City newspaper, an editorial, uh, very critical of state government. Now, I, you know, I mentioned earlier, our state government in Michigan had actually done a lot of testing, no stranger to water controversies. Uh, after the Flint water crisis, the previous governor's administration actually ramped up testing for PFAS sites. Uh, it was reported by the Traverse City newspaper that the state did not inform residents who live near the airport up there uh, in northern Michigan. And so there's a huge public outcry in that community now. So I think, um, you know, we're all still going to be talking about this issue and community response for a while. So uh, I would invite any viewers we have who take action in their community, you know, keep in touch with us. We want to help tell your stories help journalists in your communities tell your stories as well about uh, exposure, about uh, testing that you do, where you find it, and then what efforts you make. Um, help, help us tell your stories. I always, I always work that into these events. Thanks. Great. 
Justin, did you want to um, add anything about the ways that communities can get more involved or the, the role of local government um, in these topics? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say that local government also can play a role in, in placing pressure at the state and federal level. And I think, you know, so many times at a local level, we get into these debates about jobs versus the environment. And I think that this film and just the story of, of the, the huge burdens that have, that have been carried by residents is a is a is a great way to break that false uh, false choice that so many people are given, um, and and to make sure that the jobs that we do have in our community are actually safe, that they're not um, providing a couple of jobs while also poisoning us on the other end. And so I think at a local level, you know, these sorts of stories are just so so helpful um, for for breaking that false choice and and for making sure that businesses are being good neighbors. I also just think that you know again, telling your story. Um, talking with journalists, getting involved with organizations that will help you share your story at a state and federal level is just so important. Great, I hope people can really use their voice. Tracy, looks like you wanna add. Yeah, I just wanted to just bring up that, I just thought that was such an excellent point that Justin raised about this you know, supposed conflict between jobs and health, and that doesn't need to be the case. And I just, I mean, you know, Trisha, you and I worked many years ago met working on the Clean Air Act when I was at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the Clean Air Act, th that law required that the agency um, evaluate the benefits and costs of the Clean Air Act. And it's turned out that implementation of the Clean Air Act has both reduced exposures to air pollution while at the same time in growing the economy um, and also um, contributing people's lifestyles were not which you know we can argue about that but there's still more vehicle miles traveled and so i think it's a really um important demonstration that regulation is not at odds with a healthy economy in fact it can contribute to a healthy economy because people are healthier if they're not being exposed to environmental pollution and um this is something that pro people probably don't know but the federal government is required to evaluate the benefits and costs of regulations across the government. The Office of Management and Budget in the White House does this every year. And by and far, EPA is the best public dollar investment that the government makes because the benefits always outweigh the cost. And it's greater than any of the other federal agencies. So it just shows that um, by investing in cleaning up the environment and keeping the you know people healthy and doing activities that are around um, safer jobs, it's just a win-win for everybody. It's an excellent point. And we know that investing in our children and their health can pay dividends across the life course as well. And especially with these chemicals, um, as we've seen, they can really be impacting children and their health. So it's important that we're taking steps to protect our kids um, as we do this work. Um, so we have another question uh, from Richard. Uh, Tracy, this one might be for you. Are there any places or examples where citizens have taken the lead uh, in not just supporting scientists, but directing and leading scientists to follow the citizens' lead in new revelations or discoveries? Perhaps even that has redirected the way scientists have viewed their own work. Well, I would say that I, and I think Justin would also probably want to weigh in on this, is that there, and Sandy, is that it's just, I think this idea that scientists are always out there discovering these ideas is actually not, I mean, that does happen, but also many people who have had health effects or have been concerns about health effects are the ones that often are the ones that are identifying and calling out the situations in their communities. And then that has led to investigations um, to help identify potential environmental contributors. I mean, it is tricky with environmental chemicals because sometimes, you know, the exposures that may be harmful may have occurred in the past and it's hard to trace it all down. But um, but I do think that communities have been very influential in helping raise issues about certain types of exposures. Um, I will use the example of DBCP, which is a pesticide that was produced in California. And some farm workers, wives, got together at a softball game and they were comparing notes because they were all trying to, um, they were all trying to have families and they all realized that they couldn't get pregnant, that they were all having the same difficulty in getting pregnant. And it turned out that when their husbands were all tested, it was because they all had abnormally abnormal sperm, sperm count, sperm quality. 
And it was because they all had been working with DVCP. DVC ended up being banned. Um, the animal studies actually show that it was toxic before the public knew about it. But I think it's a good example about where sometimes community concerns raise the issue. It's not ideal, however, <laughs> to have people get sick and then us take care of the problem. I would say a better example is um, an NIEHS funds these types of projects are community based participatory research projects where uh, researchers work in collaboration with communities and the communities help shape the research questions that are being asked because researchers don't always know what the right thing is to do. And we think that those are very successful models. I know you guys have done it at Michigan. A lot of the children's environmental health centers that were funded have this model. They're not being, they were, the funding for those stopped under the last administration. But I think that those kinds of partnerships really lead to very fruitful collaborations for both the community and the scientists. I've, every scientist I've talked to who works with a community group is always extremely um, excited and grateful to have done that. Great. I know that um, the research center uh, that we're affiliated with at Michigan has a citizens advisory group. Um, and so our stakeholder advisory board helps us to direct some of our research and to maintain those re relationships over a long period of time. We've been working with um, community groups in Flint and in Detroit for many, many years, and we really need to establish trust uh, and to, to understand one another's lingo. You know, scientists tend to use crazy language sometimes that um, makes it difficult to understand, or we're not um, always thinking about things from the community perspective. So I think that these are really important points to bring up. And it's not just in the research, it's also in the way we evaluate the research. So when the EPA is evaluating things under TSCA, they need to be thinking about, you know, the cumulative environmental exposures, other things going on in the communities um, as they're making those risk um, determinations as well. So it's really important subject. Um, let's turn now to a question from Daniel. Uh, he asks, what are the research needs over the next five to 10 years and how can universities and communities help? Got a lot of chemicals to evaluate. How how can we get started? I think we should hear Justin speak to this first before I say anything. I was, I was going to pass it on to you. So <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got stuff to say too. I have lots of opinions about this, but uh, you know, you're on the ground there. Tell us what you think. Yeah, I mean, I, I I'd like to just go back to the previous question about getting communities involved. I mean, I think Flint is a perfect example of you know community residents, organizations like Flint Rising being ahead of the ball, ahead of government, ahead of researchers. And I think there are, there are a lot of examples of that, especially in Michigan. There are other you know great organizations like Clean Water Action, We the People of Detroit, who've also just been ahead of the game. And I think getting involved in those organizations, um, you know, whether it be funding or volunteering your time is, is a great way to identify a lot of the needs uh, that, that all of our communities are facing on this topic. And uh, um, I do have an, this is, I did talk earlier about some areas of research that I, I personally think are important, but I do want to mention um, a program that we have in California that I think is very successful. And I think the federal government could um, replicate components of that. And that is a, a data-driven approach to identify high impact, highly impacted communities or high risk communities based on environmental social factors as well as disease risks. So in California, it's called the California Environmental Screen or Cal Enviro Screen, probably because I say the acronym. I don't know if I got it all, the actual name of it, but the Cal Enviro Screen integrates data from air, pesticides, pesticide use, which actually only in California do we require pesticide use information from um, users of pesticides. So there's something to consider nationally. Um, contaminants in water, traffic related air pollution, site facility locations, as well as the uh, certain types of social indicator factors. So like income level of, the of people who live in these communities, types of health risks they might have. So um, certain types of health outcomes, like whether it's respiratory outcomes or um, adverse birth outcomes. So you can see it starts to layer in all the pieces of data that are important to identify communities who are gonna be more impacted, whether it, it, which includes pollution 
as well as demographic factors that put them at risk, as well as already having these, like you're talking about, Trish, these pre-existing health conditions. This could easily be replicated nationally. EPA has done some work on this area, but we'd like to see them really accelerate this, this type of data gathering. In California, we have a cap and trade program for greenhouse gas emissions, which generates a good amount of money. And what's been really great is that the environmental justice groups in California um, worked with the legislature to pass a law that requires that a certain portion of the funds that come from the cap and trade program have to be reinvested back into these high risk communities. So the communities who have been impacted by burdens of pollution, I mean, there are some nuances to the implementation of this that still need to be attended to, but the concept of identifying where your high risk communities are, creating a fund so that you can invest in those communities I think is a really the kind of thing that we should see um, would be really well situated to implement nationally because it the pro the one of the challenges of dealing with community by community is that there's many communities in the United States that are impacted and we need a more comprehensive approach to allow them the data and the science and the resources for them to address these types of um, environmental factors that are influencing their health. Yeah, mapping can be a really powerful tool to help us reflect the data and visualize it. Um, lots of really great data visualizations can help us understand things. Biomonitoring is another tool that can be used to help communities understand what's going on. And of course, water quality testing, air quality information, and the proliferation of um, citizen science with new types of monitors um, that can be more cheaply deployed in a, a wide scale area to help people get a picture for what's what's going on in their area. Um, Justin, did you wanna comment on, on any of these topics? I was just gonna say on the cumulative impact screening tool, that's a that's a great point. And California is, is doing this. Also New Jersey recently passed a law mandating cumulative impact analysis. We need that in Michigan um, to, to make sure that you know, we're not just addressing chemicals, PFAS and pollution and water pollution, but we're addressing the cumulative impact of, of all of these chemicals, all this exposure, because it does build up. And I think a lot of that work is also being done at the federal level. Um, it's moving more slowly. There's efforts to also make sure that a lot of the money um, is, is reinvested in, in communities that have been disinvested in. Um, so I just wanted to add that as the New Jersey model as an example, if you're interested in looking it up. Right, and I think this idea about making sure that investments go towards high impacted communities, I think is really important because there's been so many places where communities have been disinvested or impacted. And then this way, this brings back, you know, resources. And in California, you can the money doesn't necessarily have to go for environmental health concerns, but it can go for things like sustainable transportation and affordable housing and the things that the community needs to be um, more healthy, really. Right, and, I, and I'll say also on that note of, of funding, Michigan used to have some of the strongest polluter pay laws in the country, and a, a, lot, a lot of those uh, regulations were, were gutted. Um, we also, I think last year or two years ago, we had green ooze uh, from a, a chrome plating facility flowing onto our freeway, and that's just an example of just how um, how urgently we need funding to take care of a lot of these sites, but also to take care of a lot of the testing um, and and protections that we need, especially in Michigan. Great. Sandy, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I was just going to say it's always uh, heartening for me. I always like hearing faculty and professors and researchers talk about something beyond their study or when their study might be available. You know, we reach out all the time to people we know that are doing research on water issues. And a lot of the times we hear, well, that study's not done, or I'm not ready to talk about the research. It's not, we don't have the final result yet. And we always kind of bang our heads on our desk, like, well, help us understand the issue. You know, we, we understand the peer reviewed scientific process to research, but I think that's also sometimes we're missing out on, and it's gotten better. I don't mean to say like every scientific researcher is like this now. There's certainly a lot more outreach going on. Um, if pandemic's done something, it's taken events virtual and made it a lot easier to reach communities and people and audiences and archive video and let things be watched and shared with classes from K-12 to college. 
Uh, so I always, I, I'm always heartened to hear about efforts where universities are doing more beyond the research projects they're getting the grant funding for and applying that research and talking about the topics and making it understandable uh, what for, for people who are concerned about the effects of the pollution on health. I mean, they're complicated issues. And so anytime we can get beyond what's published in the journal and get it directly to the people, hopefully with the help of the media sometimes too. I always, I always like hearing those stories. Yeah, I think that we've got a, a really um, great opportunity to help people understand these topics tonight. And unfortunately, we're running a little bit late on time. And so I want to just thank the panel and um, ask each of you um, a closing question. So imagine that the panel reconvenes five years from now. So we're on the fifth anniversary of Tosca. Imagine we're on the 10th anniversary of the, the updates. In an ideal world, what would have happened? What are some of the most important elements of an improved chemical policy from your perspective? Sandy, let's start with you. Uh, I will bring it back to our film. I mean, um, Sandy Winstelt, since that film was done, she's been diagnosed with thyroid cancer. She's had her thyroid removed. She's had lymph nodes removed. <sighs> Need a moment. Um, but she's doing really well. She's continuing her work. Her voice is a little more gravelly. So the next time you see her on our program, she'll be a little raspier. The McNaughton's, on the other hand, uh, you, happier, happier ending there. Uh, they had a second child. They have two sons now, and they're all doing well. And so I just hope I can, you know, five, ten years from now that the people that we've met, and certainly they're representative of thousands, if not millions, of people who uh, have been suffering with PFAS contamination and are surviving it. And so I think they're representative of all of those people. So I hope that we will be relying on some health science and the strength of people involved to, to get through this. There's undoubtedly a lot of fights ahead, a lot of policy to be written, laws to be lobbied for and hopefully adopted and, and sites to be cleaned up and water quality enhanced. And so I just hope that uh, the people in the film in particular uh, keep doing the work and, are, and that everyone is healthy when it comes to the water they're consuming, uh, PFAS contamination or not. Excellent, thank you for that great vision. So Justin, how about you? So if you imagine we reconvene in five years, what do you wanna see having happen? Yeah, a couple of things. And for me, I, I can't name, I won't name just very specific uh, wonkish policy needs that I think would be great to see in five years. I think more than anything, I want to see communities, um, I want to see communities I want them to be believed when they say that pollution and chemicals are, are making us sick. And I think for decades, you know, I've, I've had a chance to work with amazing community residents and activists from people like Teresa Leonard, Vincent Martin, Rhonda Anderson, who's been with the Sierra Club for many years. And for so many years, people have said the pollution, the chemicals, the water pollution is making us sick. And, and whether it's government or industry, those crises have gone unheard for such a long time. So I think the first thing is I want people to be believed when they say that we know our health, we know the, the neighborhood, and we know it's not normal to have people with asthma or cancer from the chemicals uh, that we're being exposed to. So I want people to be believed. I also just want us to understand how important our, our natural resources are. So especially in a state like Michigan with our Great Lakes, you know, we have just a narrow window to take care of our, re our natural resources, everything from climate change, but also the chemicals that we've learned a lot about through this film are putting those resources at risk. Um, and I think the third thing is I want us to understand that, you know, again, whether it's healthcare costs, whether it's students trying to learn, whether it's the value of your home, I want us five years from now to just understand that this pollution, this exposure has a cost, that that cost is being borne right now, that it's simply not being covered by the industries um, that are responsible for harming our communities. And so I, I want us to, to understand that all this pollution, all this exposure has a cost. So I want people to be believed. I want us to understand how important our natural resources like the Great Lakes are. And I want us to understand that all of this, uh, whether it's inaction, whether it's the chemicals that people are being exposed to, has a real human cost that needs to be addressed with urgency. Great. Tracy, how about you? Well, I agree with both of what the speaker said. 
would say that to me, what probably I would look for is that I just want to go back to the democracy comment that we like realize how important that it is to have um, fair and open access by all the citizens to form the laws and policies in the United States that I think that we'll have to amend TSCA to really make it um, meet the, the goal, which I think Justin articulated, which is to have chemicals be held accountable and proven um, safe before they're allowed to go onto the marketplace and that we have the resources to really have comprehensive under, understanding about where the chemicals are used and their potential to influence health and that those chemicals that are identified as harming health are taken off the market. I hope that in five years, what we'll see, and I will say that it is possible to see declines in chemical exposures after the government takes action. PFOA and PFOS, which are in the family of PFOS, have gone down in the US population after they were phased out of the marketplace in 2000. So it is possible for us to actually do this, but we have many chemicals to deal with, thousands. So I would like to see that overall we have robust information to identify what the chemicals, the extent of these chemicals, to see declines in the ones that are hazardous and to really bend the curve on these health problems that we're seeing rising in the population, diabetes, obesity, adverse health, uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes, neurodevelopmental outcomes. We need to really, I think, addressing the environmental chemical exposure will help uh, address that problem and also address health inequities in, in the United States. Wonderful. So we have a lot of great things to reflect on. We'd like to see more democratic processes. We'd like to see more involvement of communities, more ability for communities to really be involved in the procedures to be sure that we're gathering the information that we need, um, being sure that robust science is used in the, the process as well, and really looking for opportunities uh, for environmental justice and to build the kinds of healthy communities that we all want to see together. And so as we look back um, on this fifth anniversary of the Lautenberg Amendments, I think we have lots of opportunities to act with foresight, and that's what we're hoping to do. And I think we also uh, want to make progress on these important health issues to reduce toxic chemicals in our environment. So I wanna really thank our panelists for this wonderful and thought-provoking discussion. Really appreciate you coming and sharing all of your knowledge and perspectives with us tonight. I also wanna thank our partners at the Detroit Public Television and Great Lakes Now Network and to our sponsors who helped to make tonight's discussion possible and especially all the people behind the scenes uh, who have been helping tonight gathering the questions and uh, helping with all of the technical pieces of this. And of course, to you, our audience, uh, we really appreciate your work um, in listening to this tonight and your future work in getting involved, uh, educating yourself and taking action on these important topics. So thanks everyone. And I encourage you to get more involved um, as we move forward. Thanks everyone. <laughs>